I mean, that word convene is in the built into the word convention. And I think our members are really experiencing the joy and the value of uh, connecting with colleagues professionally. One of the things that I find fascinating is comparing provinces in Canada and regions in how they approach and structure education, specifically professional learning. And I would say the province of Alberta, more so than any other province, is the most committed to providing professional learning from a provincial standpoint through their Alberta Teachers Association. Today's guest, Danny Moss, is the staff executive staff officer in the Alberta Teachers Association Professional Learning Department. And uh, Danny is a longtime colleague and friend. Previously, his role in Edmonton Catholic, where he served as a technology director there, uh, supporting uh, teaching and learning uh, for a number of years. And he's so, since transitioned to support uh, teachers across the province. So today's conversation, we talk a lot about sort of the shift between virtual and in-person learning, what that's like, what the appetite is, what the future of professional learning is looking like. And, and I found that fa uh, conversation fascinating. And today's uh, episode is brought to you once again by Advanced Learning Partnerships. And fun fact, our president, Amos Fodchuk, is an Alberta grown boy. He grew up in St. Paul, Alberta. So there's another connection. And a third connection I just thought of is that the launch of this podcast is the same week I will be in Alberta at the ULE conference in Banff, uh, which is put on by the Alberta Teachers Association. So lots of good learning coming from the province of Alberta. Uh, we are excited. We're actually working at the University of Alberta right now on a micro-credentialing project. So uh, lots of connections to Alberta. Hope you enjoy my conversation today with Danny Moss. All right, Danny, so good to see you again and good to connect. You and I have, have uh, our paths have crossed and we've worked together for a lot of years uh, back in Edmonton Catholic. And now you're in this, well, somewhat new, I guess you see you're about three years into this uh, new role of uh, working at the Alberta Teachers Association. So for people that don't have a context, just explain a little bit about uh, the ATA and how it sort of supports teachers and, and its, its, uh, its role in, in Alberta education. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. So thanks for having me on, Dean. Um, yeah, Alberta Teachers Association, we are both a union and a professional organization, and I work in the professional wing of uh, professional development along with my various colleagues, and we support teachers all around the province in uh, various professional development uh, endeavors. We have teachers gathering around subject areas and other topics to plan PD events. We have each of our locals offers sort of PD sessions and grants and things like that. And then um, what uh, a big portion of my work is in supporting our nine annual teachers conventions, which are big two day conferences that are kind of grassroots level created uh, it's, it's unreal the show these guys put on with keynotes and breakout sessions and exhibitors and social events. And, you know, our smallest one, I think is probably about a thousand teachers in uh, medicine hat uh, right up to our largest one in Calgary City, which is about 14,000 teachers and ranges everywhere in between. So uh, it's a lot of fun. They happen every February and March. And so we're right in the middle of it and, uh, and a couple more weeks to go. And, and it's been a tremendous amount of fun. We had to move these events uh, after decades of being in person. Like many, we had to move to online um, due to health restrictions and member safety. So, uh, yeah, it was, I think, four months after I started with ATA that uh, our whole work moved online for two years. So we had two years of online teachers conventions and teachers really enjoyed it. Uh, they enjoyed that aspect of the work and uh, being able to, instead of walking to physically to different places in a convention hall, everything was a click away. And a lot of the sessions were recorded. So if you wanted to go to three sessions at one time, you could just go to one and watch the other two later. So there were a lot of aspects they loved. But uh, what I'm observing now, Dean, is that uh, our members are just really excited to be back in person together, more so than I think they even thought they would be. Uh, you yeah. Know, it's like some of them were thinking, oh, geez, we've got to find parking and it's cold and it's February and it's 
you know, but uh, I'm really loving this. So yeah, that's been a part of my work and uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Well, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that perspective of sort of the conference and, and as you and I sort of talked before we hit record, Alberta is, I think, one of the very few provinces who are who is still um, very diligent and strategic about teacher conferences. In many cases, uh, unions, districts have just decided because of parking, because of all the, you know, somebody's got to plan these things. And these ones are actually a lot of it on the are on the backs of local teachers. And so um, there's a lot of work that goes into this. But but maybe say a little bit more about what you're finding people, people's uh, feelings are and and uh, beliefs around the the value of this of of gathering together for you know two days of learning. That's right, and I think uh, yeah, you know uh, we've we've been fortunate to have these two days of teachers convention uh, in our Alberta legislation in our school act, our education act for for decades, and so. Uh, that's sort of been a guarantee for us for many, many years that these events would be able to take place. And uh, I think teachers have enjoyed being able to step away from the classroom for two days and really connect with their colleagues, um, you know, be inspired by keynote speakers and specific breakout sessions related to their subject area and connecting with colleagues who maybe, you know, physics teachers connecting together and these teachers might otherwise be in remote areas where they're just by themselves, being able to connect together and, and share ideas and resources, et cetera. And uh, so, but uh, moving to the online space was a really interesting one because it provided a new opportunity that many never, that was never even thought of before COVID. And, um, but what I'm observing now as we return to this year of fully in-person teachers conventions is that more than ever teachers are realizing that value of connection, both professionally even I would say uh, from a mental health standpoint, you know, the value of human connection. And so, I mean, that word convene is in the built into the word convention. And I think our members are really experiencing the joy and the value of uh, connecting with colleagues professionally. Well, and then thinking about how do we sort of hold on to like both things, right? Both the affordances of technology um, that, that can do things that, that wouldn't be able to be possible without, but also the affordances of being together. And so there's this, you know, and I, I don't know that anybody's really sort of cracked the code, if you will, around like how to, how to really take full advantage of both. I think, but we're, I think we're, we're much more aware of it now. So I don't know if you, you know, outside of the convention and just some of in, in professional learning in general, what are you seeing around the trends in terms of uptake with people? Cause I think we talked about before is like, there's this crazy range of readiness that that's that exists right now for people who just like i can't do anything more i'm just trying to get through to people who are saying like yeah i i want to grow i want to learn professionally so what are you seeing in terms of the way that you're delivering it uh people's appetite for for new learning right so now that now that uh it's kind of been safe if you will uh to return to some in-person professional development, I see, I think we're seeing a sort of a, a nice blend and uh, teachers are seeing the value of, of what they experienced online in the last couple of years. And in some cases on demand PD through, you know, YouTube videos, blog posts, uh, et cetera, or, you know, zoom sessions, and, you know, breakout rooms, et cetera, did virtually and, and that, that type of space. But they're also really seeing the value of connecting in person and what that can bring. So I think, you know, that that future might be a bit of a hybrid, but uh, in terms of topics, uh, certainly coming out of the pandemic and even now, there was certainly a great deal of interest in um, mental health and wellness, social, emotional learning, uh, that trauma informed practice, uh, resiliency education. We had a great speaker um, share with our members through our teachers conventions last year and a little bit this year and, and through some other AT events, uh, Dr. Robin Hanley Defoe, she's a, a specialist in resiliency out of Ontario. Uh, she's wonderful. She was just here last week at two of our Southern teachers conventions. So certainly a lot of interest in that in terms of, uh, but, but yeah, I think uh, as teachers are moving forward, we're seeing a big shift in Alberta anyways with uh, curriculum. We've had curricula in place in some cases for over three decades, um, you know, that haven't been changed. And so there, there's been a, a very slow 
process of updating those curricula. And so, you know, there's been a lot of back and forth in terms of uh, potential changes that align sort of with government changes we saw here in Alberta, different political parties gaining power. And so while that was stalling, what I observed was a real resurgence in interest in sort of really teacher uh, teaching practices grounded in research, uh, particularly from the, the field of cognitive science. Uh, I mean, this research has been around for for over a century in some cases about, you know, cognitive science, they've really, they figured out how human beings learn, right? They, they know, but uh, it wasn't always hitting the K to 12 classroom. And so I think in the last five or so years, I've seen a real resurgence in interest with this. Uh, there was a book put out a few years ago by Henry Rediger and a couple others, uh, Make It Stick. And uh, so it was a fairly powerful book and in and, and terms of pulling in some of that research on cognitive science and how, you know, what teachers were observing is, hey, I'm a great teacher. Uh, I, my students are understanding these great lessons I'm, I'm presenting to them and, and sharing with them. They're, they're learning in the moment, but nothing's sticking with them. They can't, they can't hang on to that knowledge for long enough to be able to apply it uh, to problem solving situations, to critical thinking to using that knowledge in creative ways, right? So, um, you know, that that's why I think we've seen a real resurgence in interest in, you know, learning strategies like retrieval practice and space retrieval practice and dual coding and a few other of these practices that, that Rediger and his team um, kind of made popular with that Make It Stick book. And we've seen some of his, uh, some of his doctoral students, Dr. Pooja Garwal, uh, there, were, there were some, uh, teachers as well, K to 12 teachers involved in some of that research. And they've gone on to write some other books and uh, do some other work in that area. So there's a, another follow-up, a really great book called Powerful Teaching by Dr. Pooja Garwal. So the cognitive scientist plus Patrice Bain, a middle school teacher in the state. So it really blends that what's from the lab and the classroom together. And so, you know, there's some other groups out there uh, as well doing some great work in this space, but that's one trend I'm seeing. Um, another thing I'm seeing uh, in Alberta anyways, at least in my local context, and, you know, I'm not sure if this is, is uh, spreading to other areas, there's a, a resurgence in interest in uh, STEM education, but more specifically environmental STEM. Um, and so, you know, my observation is that, uh, you know, you and I have been around technology for a while, Dean, and, and, and there's been, you know, highs and lows. And I think where we're at coming out of the pandemic, a lot of teachers see sort of the, the 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 space that social media is occupying right now, uh, Facebook, Twitter, etc., TikTok, and there's a there's a bit of a bad taste, and people are zoomed out, right, with the online stuff, and so there's a real interest in how can I use technology for good, how can I help myself, my community, my world. Students are interested. They they want to participate in helping the environment, and so it's a really nice coming together of of using um, all kinds of cool technologies uh, to build those skills. It kind of builds on that maker movement that we've seen, you know, ten years ago moving forward, and um, and sort of has that environmental focus. So it's been pretty fun. So those are two things that I've kind of observed uh, more recently, of course. Uh, you know, this uh, generative AI tools like ChatGPT and others are really kind of making people uh, really, it's a real, real disruptive technology. So yeah, those are a couple of things I'm noticing. Well, and I, I always look to it. I, I know when I was in my sort of early days of technology and you feel like, you know, when you say that, uh, <laughs> you know, the context is like, <laughs> The year 2000, 1999, right. when, when, you know, the internet was barely a thing at that point, I know that Alberta really led the way and Alberta kind of for years, it was seen as a leader in, you know, uh, was it Supernet? I can't remember the name of the big, uh, was, internet yeah. pipe, like the first right. sort of, uh, provincial, uh, high speed connection. And they can kind of continue to, to be leaders in that area. So Alberta's had a reputation for years of being leaders in technology. And so uh, uh, fascinating to hear you talk about uh, some of those trends uh, happening. And I think with, you know, when it comes to things like AI, you know, it's not like AI is new, but sort of the 
proliferation of this new tool and others uh, that people are seeing getting in their hands to do just really pretty incredible things is is causing a lot of us to um you know, pause a little bit. Cause I think for, for you and I, in our early days, you know, we didn't probably see some of the new tools as having a nefarious uh, implication. It was like, let's create web pages. Why wouldn't we let's do this? Why wouldn't we? Right. So, you know, we were the early leaders, but now I think, you know, just as you've described, there's just more of a, well, wait a minute before we, before we just sort of sell the farm here and go in on this, let's, Let's try to understand a little bit more the implications of, and not not that the world around us is <laughs> is is joining us quite the same way, but uh, yeah, I, I wonder if you 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 know are are, are seeing more in terms of like w- w- if there's anything else you're seeing in terms of technology, um, a- and the way that specifically the way that um, schools and districts are emerging from the pandemic after having you know, a really immersive experience with technology, uh, what the sort of vibe is, if you will, around technology use in schools as it relates to, as it relates to some of this stuff. Yeah. Well, certainly in Alberta, uh, you know, coming, going into the pandemic, I think we saw, we were as close as we ever have been to a one-to-one, uh, environment. Students needed a device in those initial months and even in the subsequent school year uh school years with technology just going from in person uh back to you know remote learning etc and so we were seeing a lot more uptake in you know google classroom and and d2l brightspace and microsoft teams and these digital platforms that a lot of well you know they were fairly prevalent in school they were still only really being embraced by a a percentage of teachers and so a small percentage And, and so teachers out of necessity had to jump on board. So in one sense, it was an exciting time because, you know, I've heard some say that that the pandemic pushed technology use forward, you know, eight to 10 years uh, in, a, in a matter of a month or two and uh, out of necessity. So it was a, it was a really interesting moment. But uh, yeah, what I'm observing now is to, as schools are back to in person, I'm seeing a more judicious uh, use of technology. It's there. It's available. Uh, I can use it in my daily learning as I need it, but I'm also seeing the value of uh, other hands-on learning type, collaborative learning type things that that, uh, that we've seen for for many years. So, yeah, it is an interesting time for technology, and I think also related to that, you know, the social media piece. We're now seeing some of these tools so advanced uh, in terms of, uh, you know what they're able to create this whole fake news space and, and understanding what's real and authentic and what is sort of um, been computer generated, whether, you know, for, first of all, I mean, it goes from Photoshop to video and audio tools, which are pretty outstanding uh, that, that the average user can now use. I mean, even these video communication tools, Dean, you talked about SuperNet in the mid two thousands, you know, we were, we were dealing with 10, $15,000 $15,000 video conference systems. And now you and I are having a chat through our web browser with a click, right? It's pretty, and, and, and on the cheap. So it's pretty, a pretty, um, pretty exciting time. Um, but yeah, teachers are, you know, again, it puts a bit of a sour taste in their mouth. Some of the, what do I believe? What do I not believe um, in terms of what's coming at me? And now with, with some of these generative AI tools, we're seeing text being generated uh, that, that isn't, real in in a sense uh by an original author and so it's you know i think it's an exciting time and i think we'll adapt and i don't think it's quite as going to be as disruptive for k-12 to as uh, some might worry but uh maybe more so for you know um intro university courses where the primary method of understanding what students know is by a piece of writing they do at home yeah you're gonna have a bad time if that's how you, you know your full assessment model is but um uh, for K to 12, they still know their students and so on. But yeah, it's an interesting time with technology. And, and like I said, I I think we're seeing teachers gravitating to those uses that really can benefit students, the assistive technologies, the STEM activities that can um, build skills and awareness about the environment and about some of the skills we're going to need moving forward. Um, So yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting time with technology, no doubt. Well, and it, you know, I think to me that the 
the benefit is when people see and have a curiosity about it. That doesn't, and a curiosity doesn't necessarily have a bias one way or the other. It's just, I'm curious, like, what can this do? What can't this do? What should this do? What shouldn't this do? And uh, I think, yeah, I think as long as we can kind of lead people into those kind of conversations, uh, then you have a chance at finding out, well, how, how might we use a tool like this uh, for good? How might we use this uh, to benefit uh, teaching and learning? And I mean, it's, it's obvious there's lots of benefits, but at the same time, it's, it's filled with uh, uh, disaster in, in many cases. And so it just, it just requires curiosity. It requires care. Uh, I think it's people like you and organizations like you that uh, are kind of uh, have that responsibility to make sure that they get offered and delivered in that kind of a way that, that people get an opportunity to try something and to see it, but also, um, you know, have some judgment around that one. So um, listen, this has been good. I want to kind of finish though with uh, uh, a couple more personal questions. You, you actually did already mention, so you can, you can, you can do this if you like, you mentioned a couple books in, as you shared, but yeah. I don't know if there's anything else that you're, that you're reading that you didn't mention that that's uh, been interesting to you. And it could be per, it could be personal too. It doesn't have to be professional. So are you reading anything kind of interesting you'd like to share? As a matter of fact, I am. Oh, <laughs> One you should is. ask. Um, yeah, no, uh, more recently a book that I've read is uh, it's it, again, this, this movement with uh, into cognitive science and, and evidence-based practices is uh, really interesting to me. And there's some great work being done in the UK. Uh, in this area, and they have a whole uh, series of these books called In Action, and so they're taking some uh, research and work that others have done. And uh, so, for example, uh, this one is called uh, William and Leahy's Five Formative Assessment Strategies in Action. So, taking the work of Dylan William Shabon Leahy, who wrote in the mid 2010s, um, you know, a lot of good work on formative assessment, and it's sort of this compilation, a thin book, easy read, chock full of uh, evidence based. Uh, strategies and, and really a lot of classroom activities to go along with it. So really pinpointing to teachers, uh, strong teaching practice. So that's one thing I'm reading. Um, a guy named Peps McRae is I'm really interested in right now. He's he's out of the UK as well, and he's written a series of books uh, that also align with with uh, cognitive science. And the book I just finished from him is called Lean Lesson Planning. And so that's interesting because I think planning sometimes is a is an art and a skill that some of our young teachers uh, may struggle with. And so uh, it's, it's always a skill that's needed. Uh, and then uh, in terms of that resilience piece, uh, Calm Within the Storm, this is Robin Hanley Defoe. She's fantastic. She's not in the education space specifically. But her message really transcends to all society and sort of building a pathway to everyday resiliency. So she's a very hopeful message and a very, uh, very specific strategies on terms of building your own resiliency. And then finally, in the from the PD realm, I'm, I'm really interested in this book. It's by Elena Aguilar, who's also done a lot of work with uh, she's got a podcast called The Bright Morning Podcast. And she's done a lot of work in the area of resiliency and coaching as well. But she's she and uh, Lori Cohen have co-authored the PD book, Seven Habits That Transform Professional Development. So it kind of blends in sort of the, the human relationship element of professional development, her expertise in that, and then uh, grounded research in the area of professional development. So, yeah, never, never. Wow. There's always something to read, and uh, I'm, I'm on the road quite a bit as well around the province, and so uh, it, you know I switch from the uh, the paper based books to the audio books uh, quite frequently. Well, you got a lot a lot there to think about. What about uh, anything in the sort of uh, fun net Netflix streaming series that you're watching that that maybe is oh. a bit of a escape from <laughs> from all of the heaviness Absolutely. of that? Absolutely, yeah. I was uh, my wife and I were late getting on the uh, the Yellowstone bandwagon but uh we went heavy into that uh near the christmas break we got through all all four and a half five part of five seasons and uh they've got a couple of spinoffs now so one yeah. uh, in different time eras 1883 we finished and we're just part way through 1923 with harrison ford and helen Mirren. it's pretty it's pretty awesome uh so that's that's kind of uh, one of our guilty pleasures 
Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm on that bandwagon too. So so I'm I'm with you. Oh here. yeah. Um. So you and I have had a chance when when I've been to Edmonton, like we've gone to a few different restaurants and things like that of that nature. But I always want to know from people. Okay, so if a person's coming to visit the city, what's sort of a hidden gem? Something that maybe wouldn't be on mm. there, you know, the first top search of things to do in Edmonton. But like, what do you what would you say to people like, hey, if you're here, this is something you should experience or or visit. Right on. Uh, yeah. So on the outskirts of Edmonton, uh, the University of Alberta has a botanical gardens and it's fantastic. And they've they've had these botanical gardens for decades. And, uh, you know, they've they've had, you know, different almost like outdoor exhibits of from different places around the world and different plants and, you know, uh, that uh, and flowers, et cetera, that that you know, um, are in those regions. They've got a mountain region. They've got a Japanese garden. They've got a butterfly garden. They have a few other things. Well, over the pandemic, they had to pivot. They were a, a large portion, uh, aside from just their gate-driven revenue, they would um, have weddings. And, uh, of course, that came to a, a, an abrupt halt at the start of, you know, March 2020, like many other things. And they started to pivot, and they started to move towards uh, almost like a date night type uh, model where you've got, they've got like in the summertime, they've got like picnic lunches. So you can go and sit somewhere in the, uh, on the many beautiful areas of the botanical garden and they'll bring you a packaged picnic lunch. It's quite high end and, uh, delicious. And then, um, in the winter time, they've got some of these, you know, transparent domes where you can come and have a nice dinner. And, um, you know, and, uh, so it's a pretty unique experience. They've got kind of light show all through Christmas light show that they used to have just for like a weekend. And now it's, they have it for like three months in the winter and have these domes. So it is a hidden gem. I do recommend, uh, if you are in the Edmonton area, the university of Alberta botanical gardens. Very cool. I didn't know about that one. So that's something to mm-hmm. check out next time I'm in the city. Yeah, well, it's good, good talking to you, Danny. Good. Good catching up with you, and uh, I hope to see you uh, soon in the future and uh, continued success with uh, your work with the ATA. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me on.